All right, this is part two of our reading of Greg Beale's article on finding Christ in the Old Testament. And I do want to interact with this text a little bit as I read. But he was just finishing up talking about different ways that modern authors look at um, the New Testament use of the Old. And what he just finished up talking about is John 19.36 and how this talks about none of his bones were broken. Talking about Jesus and uh, how this is you know, foretold by the Passover lamb and it was a requirement to not break any of the bones in that. And he's talking about the, type, uh, the requirements for a type. An Old Testament type has to have an analogical correspondence. Historicity has to be forward-pointing. There's an escalation. And then there's retrospection. So the idea by retrospection is meant the idea that only after Christ's resurrection, what, uh, under the direction of the Spirit, the apostles fully understood that certain Old Testament historical narratives about persons, events, and institutions were indirect prophecies of Christ or the church. However, he finishes up making a qualification that even in the context of some of these Old Testament passages viewed as types, there is evidence of the foreshadowing nature of the Old Testament narrative itself, which is then better understood after the coming of Christ. So it's basically saying in the Old Testament it was already there. And, um, you know, of course this is our belief because Scripture has a divine author as its primary author and then human authors as the pens who pin down the Scripture and um, so the divine author is primary in our view here. So it goes on to here, number two, the criteria for discerning types of Christ in the Old Testament. So one, has the presence of those five elements of typology. Some hold that the above five elements of typology must be present in order for something to be typological. Two, the presence of the word typos or fulfillment formula in the immediate context so does the New Testament reference contain the word typos or its other forms? So you can see how the New Testament uses this in Romans 5 and I believe it's verse 14 where he references this. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. And then it says, and that's that typos word, or um, and then 1 Corinthians 10.6. 1 Corinthians 10, of course, is talking about uh, there were our examples in the Old Covenant here. It says, now these things took place as an examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And uh, anyway, so he says, does it, uh, so does the reference contain the word typos? Um, and I'm not sure which word he's looking, examples probably, yep, that's it. These things took place as examples, and that is the same word there in the Greek. You can see at the bottom, very bottom of the screen, typos, um, that we might not desire evil. So does it, the New Testament have to contain that exact word, or does it, its immediate context contain a fulfillment formula, quote, that it might be fulfilled, or some textual feature that indicates a sense of fulfillment? Quote, it is necessary that the Son of Man must be lifted up. John 12, 34. The following four points show that types in the New Testament were already seen to be foreshadowing types in the Old Testament, which show that typology in the New is not completely retrospective or created by the New Testament writer, who then imposes it onto the Old Testament. And these four points are further criteria for discerning types of Christ in the Old Testament. Three, evidence of typological anticipation in the immediate context. Another criterion for discerning types in the new is to determine if there is evidence of typological anticipation in the immediate context of some Old Testament passages. One example of this is when Matthew understands that Joseph's taking of Jesus into Egypt and back out again is a, quote, fulfillment of Israel's past journey into Egypt and their exodus back out again, which was narrated by Hosea 11.1 1 in its context. Quote, so Joseph got up and took the child and his mother where it was while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son, Matthew 2, 14 through 15. To explain this use of Hosea more thoroughly would take us far beyond the bounds of our task here, but some explanation may prove helpful. And again, I would encourage you um, to read this article. 
uh, also published in Jets 2012. This is specifically on Hosea 11, 1 in Matthew 2.15. And Greg Bill also has a lecture on this that is freely available on YouTube uh, where he kind of taught through this in a church service, I believe. It might have even been a sermon or maybe a seminary uh, that, that he was teaching this at. But anyways, he says um, the main... Uh, let's see, where do we pick up? Some have thought that Matthew wrongly read Hosea's description of Israel's past exodus as a prophecy, but Matthew's interpretation fits into the same typological pattern as the others above. The main point or goal of Hosea 11, 1 through 11 itself is the accomplishment of Israel's future restoration from the nations, including, quote, Egypt. The overall meaning of chapter 11 is to indicate that God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt which led to their ungrateful unbelief, is not the final word about God's deliverance of them. Though they will be judged, God will deliver them again, even from Egypt. This chapter begins with the exodus out of Egypt and ends with the same exodus out of Egypt. The former referring to the past event, the historical exodus, when we think about the book of Exodus, uh, and the latter to a yet future exodus or future event. According to Hosea 11, the pattern of the first exodus at the beginning of Israel's history will be repeated again at the end of Israel's history, in the end time. It is unlikely that Hosea saw these two exoduses to be accidental or coincidental or unconnected similar events. Hosea appears to understand that Israel's first exodus was to be recapitulated at the time of the nation's latter-day exodus. This mention of a first exodus from Egypt outside of Hosea 11.1 occurs elsewhere in Hosea, and a future return from Egypt would appear to be implied by the repeated prophecies of Israel returning to Egypt in the future. While Hosea 1, verses 10 through 11, and 11, 11 are the only texts in Hosea explicitly affirming a future return from Egypt. And here he's going to show you, and I love how he uses these columns, makes it very easy to refer to. So in the context of Hosea, Hosea sees the past Exodus, the first one that occurred. You read the book of Exodus, you can read all about that. And then he sees this as being recapitulated in a future exodus of the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Okay, so the first exodus of e out of Egypt in the book of Hosea. Hosea 2, 15b, And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. Though this passage compares the first with a future exodus. Hosea 12, 13, But by a prophet the Lord brought Israel from Egypt, and by a prophet he was kept. Hosea 12, 9, but I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt. Hosea 13, 4, yet I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except me, for there is no Savior besides me. And then this, that's the first exodus out of Egypt. On the right side, you see a future return to Egypt, implying a future return from Egypt. Hosea 7, 11, so Ephraim has become like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. Hosea 7.16, their princes will fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. They will be their derision in the land of Egypt. So if you're going to have a return from Egypt, as Hosea 11.1 1 says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. If you're going to have a return to Egypt, you got to have, a, and then you're going to come out of it afterwards. If you're going to have a return out of Egypt, you have to go back into it, basically is what he's saying. Um, Hosea 8, uh, 13 B now will, uh, now he will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins. They will return to Egypt. Hosea 9, 3, they will not remain in the Lord's land, but Ephraim, Israel there, will return to Egypt and in Assyria they will eat unclean food. Hosea 9, 6, for behold, they will go because of destruction. Egypt will gather them up. Memphis, again, Egypt here, will bury them. Weeds will take over their treasures of city. Thorns will be in their tents. Hosea 1, 11, and they, Israel, will go up from the land of Egypt. Hosea 11, 5, he, Israel, assuredly will return to the land of Egypt. So note the implication of a future exodus from Egypt in Hosea 2, 15, above, right here. Okay, so if one had asked Hosea if he believed that God was sovereign over history and that God had designed the first exodus from Egypt, uh, had designed that the first exodus, Exodus from Egypt was a historical pattern that foreshadowed a second Exodus from Egypt, would he not likely have answered yes? 
At least this appears to be the way Matthew understood Hosea, especially using the language of the first Exodus from Hosea 11.1, 1, in the light of a, the broader and particularly the immediate context, especially of Hosea 11, where a return to Egypt is predicted, Hosea 11.5, and whose main point and goal is the end time Exodus back out of Egypt. Let's read Hosea 11 as in its entirety since he has referenced it so much. It's a rather short chapter. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burned offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king. And this is debated here. You can see uh, this is this is says surely is the alternate translation here. Well, how can not and surely be the same thing? The idea is is sort of a question. Shall they not surely return to the land of Egypt? Uh, but Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. And I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord. He will roar like a lion when he roars. His children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, declares the Lord. Ephraim has surrounded me with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God and is faithful to the Holy One. So again, he's talking about on all these passages in Hosea 11, Matthew understood the context and of the book of Hosea, Hosea 11 in particular, and he especially understood the language of that first Exodus from Hosea 11.1 1, in light of the broader and particularly immediate context of the entire chapter where return to Egypt is predicted. We read that in 11.5. And whose main point and goal is the end time Exodus back out of Egypt. 11 here, they shall come trembling like birds from Egypt. What better language to use for Hosea's prophecy of the second exodus and the beginning of its fulfillment in Jesus than the language already at hand describing the first exodus. This is a short step away from saying that the first exodus was seen by Hosea and more clearly by Matthew as a historical pattern pointing to the recurrence of the same pattern later in Israel's history. In this respect, Matthew's use of Hosea 11.1 1 may also be called typological in that he understood in the light of the entire chapter 11 of Hosea that the first exodus in Hosea 11.1 1 initiated a historical process of sin and judgment to be culminated in another final exodus, Hosea 11.10-11. Duane Garrett has also said this in, said in this regard, quote, We need look no further than Hosea 11 to understand that Hosea 2 believed that God followed patterns in working with his people. Here the slavery in Egypt is the pattern for a second period of enslavement in an alien land, and the exodus from Egypt is the type for a new exodus. Thus, the application of typological principles to Hosea 11.1 1 by Matthew is in keeping with the nature of prophecy itself and with Hosea's own method. Many commentators have observed that the placement of the quotation of Hosea 11.1 1 in Matthew 2.15 appears to be out of order, since the quotation is appended directly only to the report of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus going into Egypt and not coming out of Egypt. Rather, they are said to come out of Egypt only later in 2.21, and we've already read that in my first video. In this connection, and that's, of course, after Herod dies, after he uh, kills all the, uh, the infants there, and then the uh, angel of the Lord comes to a dream to Joseph, and they return out of Egypt. So, Rather, they are said to come out of Egypt only later in 221. In this connection, the repeated Old Testament pattern of Israel or Israelites re-entering Egypt and then coming back out of Egypt stand in the background of Matthew's reference to Hosea 11.1 and have a bearing on the apparent odd placement of the quotation. 
The reference to Hosea 11.1, we have argued, is to be seen within the repeated references throughout the book to a past exodus and Israel's future re-entering and subsequent return out of Egypt. In particular, this pattern is fully found in within Hosea 11 itself. What he's saying here is you have to understand, why does Matthew talk about Jesus and his family coming out of Egypt when Jesus and his family were going into it? Well, the idea is that the book of Hosea 11 does the same thing. Uh, or the book of Hosea in chapter 11, you have Israel going in and then back out. And so that's why the quotation is the way it is. So he says here, Hosea 11, 5, only four verses after verse 1, says that he, Israel, indeed will return to the land of Egypt. And this is followed by the main narratival point of the entire chapter that, quote, his sons will come trembling like birds from Egypt, Hosea 11, 11. Thus, the 11th chapter of Hosea begins with Israel's past exodus from Egypt, Hosea 11.1, 1, is punctuated in the middle with reference to Israel's re-entering Egypt and concludes with a promise of their future return from Egypt, Hosea 11.11. 11. Some have seen it to be problematic that what was spoken of the nation in Hosea 11.1 1 is applied by Matthew, not to the nation, but to an individual messianic figure. Accordingly, Matthew is seen by some as distorting the original corporate meaning of Hosea 11.1. 1. However, the application of what was applied to the nation of, in Hosea 11.1 1, to the one person, Jesus, also may have been sparked by the prophecy at the end of Hosea 1.11, where, and they will go up from the land, is a reference to going up from the land of Egypt, especially since it is an allusion to Exodus 1.10 and Isaiah 11.16. And we'll look at those verses here. Hosea 1 and verse 11 says, And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So notice they, it's a they, but they have appointed for themselves a head. And he says here, you go to Exodus 1.10. Exodus 1.10 says, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. And uh, Isaiah eleven sixteen says here, And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people, as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. After all, what sense does it make, and here we're going back to Hosea 1.11, they will go up from the land. We read that multiple times here. And um, we're talking about how can something that's applied corporately apply to one individual. He says, after all, what sense does it make that this refers to the land of Israel, since at the end time Israel was to be restored back to her land, and to describe this as Israel going up from her own land would be exceedingly odd at best. If this is a reference to Israel's future return from Egypt, it fits admirably with the hope expressed in Hosea 11, verses 10 through 11, and other such implied references noted above. And it would specifically affirm that such a future exodus would be led by an individual leader. And they will appoint for themselves one leader, literally the Hebrew reads, one head, and they will go up from the land. Such a return led by an individual leader appears to be further described in Hosea 3, 5. And we'll read that. Hosea 3, Verse 5 says, Afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king. And they shall come and fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. And notice David's been dead for many years. We understand this to be referring to Christ. Uh, we're going to talk about reading Christ, finding Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, many prophecies refer to the throne of David, David the king, reigning in the end times. Um, and the throne of David being established forever. Of course, this is fulfilled by Christ as the New Testament flushes out. But again, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord, and David their king, and they shall come in the fear of the Lord to the goodness, uh, to his goodness in the latter days. So um, this is uh, a return led by an individual leader is explained here, and he quotes it. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord uh, their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord in the last days. This image of trembling in Hosea 3.5 to describe the manner in which Israel approaches God when they are restored is parallel to the description of the manner of their restoration in Hosea 11.10-11 where they will come trembling from Egypt. Trembling is repeated twice, though a different Hebrew verb is used. 
This may point further to Hosea's biblical theological understanding that when Israel would come out of Egypt in the future, according to Hosea 1.11 and 11.10-11, through 11, they would indeed be led by an individual king, which enhances further why Matthew could apply the corporate national language of Hosea 11.1 1, and apply it to an individual king, Jesus. Could Matthew not have engaged in such a biblical, biblical theological reading of Hosea? There is one last rationale for understanding how Matthew can take what applied to the nation in Hosea 11.1 1, and apply it to the individual Messiah. Dwayne Garrett has analyzed the use of Genesis in Hosea and has found that repeatedly the prophet alludes to descriptions in Genesis of the individual patriarchs and to other significant individuals in Israel's history. Sometimes these are good portrayals and sometimes bad. The prophet Hosea applies these descriptions to the nation of his day. For example, the iniquity of Israel in the present involves her following the same pattern of disobedience as that of Adam. You see that in Hosea 6 and verse 7. Hosea 6, 7 says, But they, like Adam, ha have transgressed the covenant. They, uh, there, they de there they dealt faithlessly. Sorry, I cannot read all of a sudden. Faithlessly with me. I'm trying to go too fast here. So they follow that same disobedience pattern of Adam or Jacob in Hosea 12. We'll scroll down here, and that's verses 2 through 5. He says, The Lord has an indictment against Judah, and he will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel, and in his manhood, he strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He met God at Bethel, and there God spoke with us. Uh, so again, you can see how this is Adam, Jacob being paralleled with the iniquity of Israel and being paralleled to individuals. And the promise made to the individual Jacob to make your seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered because of multitude. That's just Genesis 32 and Genesis 15 and 22, which is addressed to Abraham. This is now reapplied and addressed directly to the nation of Israel. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. Hosea 1.10. Similarly, the Valley of Achor where Achan and his family were taken to be executed for his sin. This is in Joshua 7 when they lost the battle of Ai. And uh, Achan and his family were um, killed for um, you know, keeping idols and he hid it under his tent. Anyways, this is taken by Hosea and reversed to indicate that God would reverse Israel's judgment of defeat and exile and would not be exterminated for her sin, but would have a hope of redemption. This is in Hosea 2.15 which says, And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor. Remember, this is where Achan was um, uh, killed here. A door of hope, and there she shall, be, she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. So this is seen as a, a reversal here. Or she would have a hope of redemption. Instead of going from the one to the many, Matthew goes from the many Israel to the one, Jesus, but utilizes the same kind of one and many corporate hermeneutical approach to interpreting and applying prior scripture as did Hosea. Matthew's hermeneutical methods are the same as Hosea. Hosea uses the Old Testament the same way Matthew uses the Old Testament. And because Hosea became part of the Old Testament, Matthew uses the same Old Testament hermeneutics. So again, if you're going to throw out Matthew, you got to throw out the whole Bible. You really, it's all scripture stands or falls together. Um, and we believe, of course, that it's infallible and inerrant and that there are no real problems here. There are problems to us because we don't have the full knowledge of God and we don't have the knowledge that the uh, apostles did. Uh, we don't have the knowledge of the Old Testament that the Old Testament writers did themselves. Uh, anyways, so he says, I have elaborated on this typological use of Hosea 11.1 since it is an example of a type that is not purely retrospective from the New Testament vantage point. That is, this was not a perspective understood by Matthew only after the events of Jesus' coming. Rather, there are substantial indications already in Hosea 11 itself and its immediate context that Israel's past exodus out of Egypt was an event that would be recapitulated again typologically in the eschatological future. So again, Hosea 11, when he wrote about Israel coming out of Egypt, it's anticipated already in that chapter itself that this would be fulfilled in the one-time, uh, end-time Messiah 
Jesus, one person representing corporately his people coming out of Egypt. Anyways, four, indications of typology in the wider canonical Old Testament context. Another criterion for discerning types in the New Testament may be used. Even when the immediate context of an Old Testament passage does not indicate that something is being viewed typologically from the Old Testament author's conscious vantage point, the wider canonical context of the Old Testament book or of the Old Testament itself usually provides hints or indications that the passage is typological for something in the New. The portrayal of Eliakim as a ruler in Isaiah 22, 22 viewed typologically in Revelation 3, 7, may be one such example. Let's look at these two passages. Isaiah 22, 22, which states, uh, And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And you can see in context here it says, In that day I'll call my son Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Uh, and he talks about he will give him uh, the key of the house of David etc. And so this is up in Revelation 3. We look at verse number uh, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. So this might be an example here that there's indications in the wider Old, uh, Old Testament canonical context that there is typology here. So Christ is the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one shut, and who shuts and no one opens. The immediate context of Isaiah 22 provides clues that the this Old Testament passage was intended originally by Isaiah as a type that points forward. The description of placing the key of the house of David, which would be administrative responsibility for the kingdom of Judah, on his or Eliakim's shoulder, the mention of him being a father to those in, quote, Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, and the reference to him being, uh, to him as, quote, becoming a throne of glory, would all have facilitated such a prophetic understanding of Isaiah 22, 22, since this language is so strikingly parallel to that of the prophecy of the future Israelite ruler of Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, which states that the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called Eternal Father who sits on the throne of David. In fact, as mentioned earlier, it is likely that Isaiah 22, 22 intentionally applies the language of the coming Messianic king to Eliakim to show him to be a figure who might potentially fulfill the Isaiah 9 prophecy. God did not deem that Eliakim be that figure, and so his decretive word caused Eliakim to fall and not to achieve what Isaiah 9 predicted. In contrast, God promised that at some point in the future, he would finally accomplish the fulfillment in one who would realize the prophetic description. Quote, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. If the connection drawn between Isaiah 9, 6-7, and 22-22 is correct, then it is probable that Isaiah himself would have been aware to some degree of the link and seen Eliakim as one who failed to fulfill the earlier prophecy, but also as one whose failure pointed to the eventual success of another who would fulfill it. Accordingly, Revelation 3.7, and you can see this all throughout Scripture. I mean, if you look at Genesis 3.15 and the promise of the seed to the woman, uh, when Eve finally has a child, uh, Seth there, or Cain and Abel, when she has her children, she uh, believes that this would be the one that would fulfill it. And of course, we know that Adam failed. We know that all after Adam sinned, and we know ultimately that Israel as a corporate Adam failed, but then uh, Christ as the second and the last Adam did what Adam and the nation of Israel corporately failed to do, and this is seen as a pattern over and over in Scripture and is why we can do these typological things, because Scripture was intended to be read accordingly. So, it says, accordingly, Revelation 3.7 would see that the Isaiah 9 pattern, partially and temporarily, reflected, uh, or is that temporally? Yeah, temporally, reflected in Eliakim, and which Isaiah understood, pointed still forward to another, was finally fulfilled in Jesus. In addition, the reference to Eliakim as my servant in Isaiah 22:20 20, would have been easily associated with Isaiah's messianic servant prophecies of 40 through 53. Of course, everybody knows Isaiah 53, right? Uh, which talks about who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. It talks about him being crushed for our iniquities, our, the uh, you know, chastisement that brought us peace. He bore all those things. 
clearly talking about the crucifixion of Christ, and that's my servant here. Since the phrase occurs uh, there five times in this respect, there are other indications from the immediate context of Revelation 3.7, which indicates that Eliakim was a foreshadowing of Christ. And he gives some references down here, uh, which you can read in Bill's handbook here uh, on the New Testament use of the Old. But even if there were no such contextual intimations within the book of Isaiah itself, one can plausibly say that Isaiah had generically understood the prior biblical revelation about Israel's coming eschatological ruler and David's heir, so that even if messianic nuances were not in his mind when he wrote that verse, he would not have disapproved of the use made of his words in Revelation 3.7. Thus, Isaiah supplied a little part of the revelation unfolded in the course of salvation history about kingship, but he himself perceived that part to be a pictorial representation of the essence of Davidic kingship. In this regard, D.A. Carson affirms with respect to the New Testament writer's use of um, typology, quote, the New Testament writers insist that the Old Testament can be rightly interpreted only if the entire revelation is kept in perspective as it is historically unfolded. You see this in Galatians 3, 6-14. Hermeneutically, this is not an innovation. Old Testament writers drew lessons out of earlier salvation history, lessons difficult to be to completely perceive while that history was being lived, but lessons that retrospect would clarify. Asaph in Psalm 78 on Matthew 13, 35. Matthew, for example, does the same in the context of the fulfillment of Old Testament hopes in Jesus Christ. We may therefore legitimately speak of a fuller meaning than any one text provides, but the appeal should be made not to some hidden divine knowledge, but to the pattern of revelation up to that time, a pattern not yet adequately or fully discerned. The new revelation may therefore be truly new, yet at the same time capable of being checked against the old and thus clarifying the older revelation. I think that's a great way to word it. Carson does this uh, masterfully here. Thus is there evidence outside the immediate context of the focus Old Testament passage itself that the reference was already conceived to be part of a foreshadowing pattern. If so, then there would be some grounds in the Old Testament context itself that would lead a New Testament writer to understand such a reference to be a typological fulfillment, even if there is not a fulfillment formula or some clear indication of fulfillment in the near, nearby New Testament context. In other words, it doesn't have to say it is written uh, you know, in the prophets that, quote, this would happen. Another example of this is Genesis 12, verses 10 through 20, in conjunction with Genesis 15, 13 through 16. In Genesis 12, 10 through 20, Abraham seeks refuge in Egypt because of a famine in the land, outside where there is a threat of being killed, but his wife is spared. Yet subsequently, Abraham is treated well and increases his wealth while there. Then Pharaoh is struck with plagues, so that the Egyptians sent away Abraham and all that belonged to him. Then in Genesis 15, 13 through 16, God prophesies to Abraham that his seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years, but I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. And afterward, they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Hey, look at that. Abraham in Egypt becomes rich and is sent away. Okay, then he says later in, in Genesis, the people, the nation of Israel will be strangers in the land and you're going to have an exodus. So Abraham was a corporate representative whose life in Egypt was a prophetic pattern for his descendants and the basis for the prediction in Genesis 15. So look at that Old Testament use of the old. We can see that both went into Egypt due to a famine. There is a threat of males being killed, but females being spared. There was good treatment followed by plagues on Pharaoh. There is an increase of wealth, and then Pharaoh sends them out, sends out Israel as a result of the plagues. You cannot miss that pattern. In light of these parallels, Gordon Wenham says, The story of Abraham and Egypt, foreshadowing as it does the later bondage of Egypt and the Exodus, is an example of the typology that patterns many Old Testament narratives. This typological paralleling of Abraham with the Exodus from Egypt is, clear, is especially clear in Isaiah verses, in chapters 40 through 55. Here, the return from the Babylonian exile is repeatedly compared with the Exodus on the one hand and with the call of Abram on the other. And you can see many Isaiah verses there. Similar typological thinking is found in the New Testament by Matthew 
who explicitly compares Israel's exodus from Egypt with Jesus' return to Palestine from there. Paul compares the exodus to the church's experience in Christ. And we read that already a little bit in 1 Corinthians 10 and how they were all baptized in Moses that came through the Red Sea. They followed that same rock, which was Christ. Um, and since Abram was also in Egypt, the believer is thus invited to look back to the life of Abraham and see in it an adumbration of his Lord's experiences. And you can see this in Romans chapter 4 and Hebrews eleven eighteen through 19. Romans 4, of course, uses Abraham as an example of justification by faith. And Hebrews 11 is that great roll call of faith, which talks about uh, many heroes from the Old Testament looking at them being uh, believers in Christ, even in the Old Testament, and as they can be examples for us. And of course, Hebrews 12 opens up, seeing that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Another example is Noah being patterned after the first Adam, which we will discuss below. Therefore, New Testament writers may interpret historical portions of the Old Testament to have a forward-looking sense in the light of the whole Old Testament canonical context. For example, the portrayal by various eschatological prophecies about a coming king, priest, and prophet throughout Old Testament revelation were so intrinsically similar to the historical descriptions of other kings, priests, and prophets elsewhere in the Old Testament that the latter were seen to contain the same pattern of the former except for the historical failure, and thus to point forward to the ideal end-time figures who would perfectly carry out these roles. The following point bears out this assertion about kings, priests, and prophets being typological. 5. Literary clustering of commissions to prophets, priests, and kings. Another criterion for discerning types in the New Testament is literary clustering of repeated commissions to prophets, priests, and kings. Gerhard, uh, Gerhard von Rad observed that in certain sections of the Old Testament are repeated narrations of Yahweh's commissioning people to fulfill certain offices, like that of judges, prophets, priests, or kings. In these clustering of narrations are the repeated descriptions of a commission, the failure of the one commissioned, and judgment, and then the same cycle is repeated. Von Rad proceeds to draw the following typological significance of these narratives. Quote, the range of Old Testament saving utterances is that which tells of the cause of charismatic persons and of people summoned to great offices. In the case of certain descriptions of the call and the failure of charismatic leaders, such as Gideon, Samson, and Saul, we are dealing with literary compositions which already show a typological trend in that the narrators are only concerned with the phenomenon of the rise and speeding failure of the men thus called. Here, too, in each case, there is a fulfillment, the proof of the charisma and victory. Suddenly, however, these men are removed. Yahweh can no longer consider them. And the story ends with the, re uh, ends with the reader feeling that, since Yahweh has uh, so far been unable to find a really suitable instrument, the commission remains unfulfilled. Can we not say of each of these stories that Yahweh's designs far transcend their historical context? What happened to the ascriptions of a universal rule made by Yahweh to the kings of Judah? See Psalm 2, 72 and 110. <clears throat> it is impossible that the post-exilic readers and transmitters of these messianic texts uh, saw them only as venerable monuments of a glorified but vanished past. These men, the judges, Saul, David, etc., all passed away, but the tasks, the titles, and the divine promises connected with them were handed on. The Shebna Eliakim Pericope, which we read there in Isaiah 22, is a fine example of such transmission. The almost messianic full powers of the unworthy Shebna will fail. Thus, the office of the key of David remained unprovided for until finally it could be laid down at the feet of Christ, Revelation 3.7. It is in this sense, i.e. in the light of a final fulfillment and of the ceaseless movement towards such a fulfillment, that we can speak of a prophetic power resident in the Old Testament prototypes. No special hermeneutic, hermeneutic method is necessary to see the whole diversified movement of the Old Testament saving events made up of God's promises and their temporary fulfillments as pointing to their future fulfillment in Jesus Christ. This can be said quite categorically. The coming of Jesus Christ as a historical reality leaves the exegete no choice at all. He must interpret the Old Testament as pointing to Christ, whom he must understand in this light. Great quote there. So thus, Von Rad 
contends that the literary clustering of repeated commissions and failures is evidence of a type within the Old Testament itself. Furthermore, the forward-looking nature of these cyclic narratives of people and events can be discerned within the Old Testament itself, and often within each of the narratives themselves. Accordingly, if Von Rad is correct, and I believe he is, this would mean that we can recognize Old Testament types as having a prophetic element even before their fuller revelation of their fulfillment in the New. So even within the Old Testament itself, there is built within the text the typological elements that um, don't have to necessarily be flushed out in the New. Of course they are, but just looking at the Old Testament itself and the patterns there within it, there is that typological um, meaning and purpose already there in the text. Six, Old Testament characters styled according to pattern of earlier Old Testament characters. Another criterion for discerning types in the New entails old, New Testament, Old Testament, characters styled according to the pattern of earlier Old Testament characters who are viewed as types of Christ in the New Testament. If it can be shown in the Old Testament itself that a later person is seen as an anti-type, the fulfillment of, of an earlier person who is clearly viewed as a type of Christ by the New, then this later Old Testament person is also likely a good candidate to be considered to be a type of Christ. For example, there's abundant evidence that uh, Noah is patterned after the first Adam, and that the intention for this pattern or pattering is to indicate that Noah is a typological fulfillment of Adam. Noah, for example, is given the same commission as the first Adam. We can see this in Genesis 1:28 and Genesis 9, 1 through 2 and verse 7. He's told, you know, to um, I mean, if you just look at those verses, you can see he's told to repopulate the earth and given the same uh, commission to take dominion, etc. It becomes quite apparent, however, that Noah as a second Adam figure does not accomplish the commission given to the first Adam. Of course, Noah immediately gets drunk, fails his task. Just as the first Adam failed in the same way. Note the many parallels between the first Adam and Noah. The world that was, Genesis 1-7, you have creation, the waters of chaos cover the earth, Genesis 1-1-2. Adam is the man commissioned in God's image, Genesis 1.26. You have the fall, Adam sins in the garden, Genesis 3.2. Noah makes the vineyard, etc. Seed conflict, Cain is condemned to wonder, founds uh, the wicked city of Enoch, Genesis 4.17. And judgment, days of Noah are upon the earth, Genesis 6.13. Then we move on uh, to the spirit hovers upon the face of the waters, Genesis 1.2. The dry land emerges, vegetation is brought forth, Genesis 1.12. The old world is finished, God rests, Genesis 2.2. Two. two man is commissioned to fill, fill the earth, Genesis 1.28. God brings animals for Adam's name, Genesis 2.19. Adam partakes of the fruit of knowledge, Genesis 3.6. Adam is shamefully naked, Genesis 3.7. Adam's nakedness is covered by God, Genesis 3.21. Adam's sin brings curse upon the seed, Genesis 3.15. Seth, with uh, son Enosh, begins to call upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 4.26, daughters of man are taken to wife by the sons of God. Genesis 6.2, and God brings a cloud upon the earth to destroy the wicked with a flood. Genesis 7.23, the old heavens and earth pass away before the present heavens and earth. This is seen in 2 Peter 3.5-7 through 7, where we have a, an explanation of this. The world that now is, Genesis 8 through Revelation 22. This is a comparison here. The new creation, waters of Noah cover the earth, just like here, waters cover the earth, chaos there, waters of chaos cover the earth, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, we're making parallels. The dove hovers upon the face of the waters, just like the spirit hovered on the waters in Genesis 1. The olive leaf betokens emergence of dry land, the land coming out of the waters there, it's also seen in the creation account of Genesis. The present world is finished, God receives a sacrifice of rest, Genesis 8, 21. Uh, so that's the new creation. Noah is the new Adam. Man is recommissioned in God's image. Man again uh, is commanded to fill the earth. God brings animals for Noah to deliver. And again, you can read these verses here. The fall, renewed. Noah sins in a vineyard. Noah partakes of the fruit of the vine. Noah is shamefully naked. Noah's nakedness is covered by his sons. And Noah's sin brings curse upon his seed. There with Cain and, and being cursed, uh, Ham's son. Uh, seed conflict is renewed. Noah's sons, to avoid wandering, found the wicked city of Babel. Shem's descendant, Abram, brings, begins to call upon the name of the Lord, Genesis 12, 8. The harlot Babel seduces the sons of Zion throughout the ages. You can see this in many verses. And the new judgment, the days of Noah are again upon the earth, Matthew 24. 
God comes in clouds to destroy wicked with a fire. Matthew 25, verse 30, or 24, verse 30, and Second Peter 3, 7. <clears throat> the present heavens and earth pass away before the new heavens and earth. 2 Peter 3, 13. So thus, the completion of fulfilling God's commission to Adam remained unfulfilled, even in the semi-typological fulfillment in Noah. So that both the first Adam and Noah, as a secondary Adamic figure, pointed to another Adam yet to come, who would finally fulfill the commission. That a prophetic element is present in the two parallel is apparent from two observations. First, Noah's name, which means rest, is explained as this one shall give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Genesis 5.29 The second prophetic pointer lies in observing that Christ and Peter both refer to the idea that the days of Noah will be on the earth again before a coming universal judgment. That's Matthew 24 and then of course 2 Peter there. Why did they say this? Because all the parallels between the first Adam and Noah as another Adam are all completed within Genesis 1-9 except for the last panel. The first Adamic world ends in judgment, but this judgment panel has no fulfillment in the New Testament. Christ and Peter likely realized all the patterns of the first Adam had been completed in Noah. The second Adam, <clears throat> the quote second Adam, except for the universal judgment panel. Thus they knew that the first world was the pattern for the second world, and that the final panel of universal judgment had to occur at some point to complete the second world's modeling on the first. And he's talking about this panel here, the new judgment, <clears throat> where Jesus in Matthew 24 talks about the days of Noah, God's coming in clouds to destroy the wicked with the fire, the present heavens and earth pass away before the new heavens and earth, 2 Peter 3, verse 13. <clears throat> Another example would be the case of Joshua in renewing the covenant and leading the people of God into the promised land. This is also from Beale's handbook here. Quote, since the original reader observer would have been justified in interpreting Joshua as the second Moses figure, see Deuteronomy 31, Joshua 1, and Joshua 3 through 7, and since Jesus may also be viewed as the second Moses, it is possible to correlate the significance of Joshua's acts of salvation and conquest of the promised land to the work of Christ. Or consider the relation of Adam, Noah, and Christ, an example discussed briefly earlier in this essay. Significant Old Testament commentators view Adam to be a type of Noah in the Genesis narrative itself. <clears throat> Nowhere in the New Testament, however, does it say that Noah is a type of Christ. Nevertheless, if Noah is a partial anti-type of the first Adam, but does not fulfill all to which the typological first Adam points, then Noah also can plausibly be considered a part of the Adamic type of Christ in the Old Testament. And I can see this. I mean, you look at Noah and how <laughs> the people who were with Noah got in the ark and were saved. I mean, you see this with uh, Christ today and how that could clearly be Noah and the ark there being a type of Christ. All who are in Christ... Um, are saved. And Noah, uh, in his day, the Lord shut the door of the ark. And so it is the Lord gathers us into his fold, and we are safe and um, preserved from the judgment that will come upon this current creation and bring in the new heavens and new earth. Seven, partially fulfilled Old Testament prophecies pointing to more complete New Testament fulfillment. Yet another criterion for discerning types in the New Testament is this. Events of partially fulfilled Old Testament prophecies within the Old Testament itself point to a more complete fulfillment in the New. A similar kind of typology involves Old Testament prophets who in, whose ensued prophecies that were to be fulfilled in the short term, at least at some point within the Old Testament epoch itself. When the prophecy is fulfilled, it is clear that the full contours of the prophecy have not been consummately fulfilled consummately. Then the partial historical fulfillment itself becomes a foreshadowing of or points to a later complete fulfillment in the latter days. Good examples of this are prophecies of the day of the Lord, which predict judgment on a catastrophic scale. Although these day of the Lord prophecies are fulfilled in various events of judgment within the Old Testament period itself, such as parts of the prophecy of Joel, where the phrase occurs five times, all the details of the predicted destruction are not fulfilled. And this is, this is remarkable. I think this really helps us understand hermeneutically what's going on with these passages 
from the Old Testament where, you know, you do see this text that talks about the day of the Lord and how, you know, at first blush, it's like, well, that seems like it's applying to uh, events only within Joel's day, but maybe not everything from the Joel prophecy was fulfilled in Joel's day. So there's there's a part of that, of that predicted destruction that's not fulfilled. Consequently, the nature of the fulfillment within the Old Testament itself contains a pattern that points yet forward to the climactic period of such fulfillment when the pattern is fully fulfilled uh, or fully filled out, the day of the Lord par excellence. So there is a sense when the day of the Lord you know, came in that Old Testament, it is right to see you know, the immediate Old Testament fulfillment of those passages, but because there was not a complete fulfillment, it points greater still to a, a larger fulfillment, which we see in Christ uh, when he returns to this earth the second time, and largely even at his first coming. Another example here are the prophecies of Israel's restoration from Babylon, which were partially but not completely fulfilled when a remnant of Israel returned from Babylon after 70 years in captivity. So we can see here, let's look at Second Chronicles and chapter number 36. This is verses 20 through 23, which says, uh, He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped with, from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. So this is an example here of a, uh, Israel's restoration from Babylon, which is partially but not yet completely fulfilled when the remnant of Israel returns after their 70 years captivity. Note what was to be fulfilled at Israel's restoration, which was not fulfilled at the time of Israel's physical return from Babylonian captivity. And look here, let's read before we get to this, we'll look at those Jeremiah passages where you can see this. Jer uh, so to just flush this out a little bit, 2 Chronicles quotes Jeremiah and this prophecy and their return by the proclamation of Cyrus and this remnant leaving Babylon, returning to the land. 2 Chronicles understands that as being fulfilled. However, it is a partial fulfillment because not every element was fulfilled as prophesied by Jeremiah, which anticipates greater fulfillment in the future. So we can see in Jeremiah 25, 12, then after... Seventy years are completed. I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. And he goes here through verse 13. I will bring upon the land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. And then we look in Jeremiah 29, where he says in 10 through 14, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I'll bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So what was to be fulfilled at Israel's restoration, which was not fulfilled at the time of Israel's physical return from Babylonian captivity, included the resurrection of Israelite saints. Now, we'll get to uh, that maybe in later on in this article, but uh, maybe if, even if it's not explicitly there in Jeremiah, what he's doing here is looking largely at multiple Old Testament passages which say what would come back what would happen when Israel was um, uh, returned from exile? You see the resurrection of Israelite saints. The resurrection day has not occurred yet. You see a new creation. Again, that has also not occurred yet. 
uh, kingdom established over the entire world, the coming of the Messiah. The nations would stream into Israel and be converted. God would make a new covenant with Israel. Foreign powers will no longer rule over Israel. God will bestow the Spirit on Israel. A huge temple will be rebuilt. Miracles would happen. The deaf would hear and the blind will see. There will be definitive forgiveness. He's pulling in Isaiah here, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these different Old Testament books that uh, talk about when Israel returns from Babylonian captivity, you're going to see the new creation, the Messiah ruling over all, etc., etc. Of course, that wasn't fulfilled when Israel returned out of Babylon. There were elements of these prophecies that were, but because there's only a partial fulfillment, there's an anticipation of a greater fulfillment and these things serving as types of how those things would be fulfilled in Christ. So he goes on to say, yet none of these prophecies, uh, none of these promises was were fulfilled when the remnant of Israel returned from Babylon after 70 years of captivity. Thus the full prophecy remained to be completely, completely fulfilled at some future time, which the Gospels and Paul see as beginning to be fulfilled at Christ's first coming and consummated at Christ's final coming. We have to look at this. This is huge here. Look in Isaiah 35, a great chapter. Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. And then 61, 1, says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisoner to those who are bound. Of course, you probably recognize that Jesus himself uh, recognizes those verses as being fulfilled in him. He says in Matthew eleven five. He says, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the deaf dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. What's Jesus doing here? He's quoting Isaiah 35. He's saying, hey, this is fulfilled in me. He's even beginning to be fulfilled in my first coming. Look here, uh, we read uh, Isaiah 61, 1, and you also note that, that this is uh, in Luke's gospel. And um, we can see this. Luke 17, I forget the exact passage, but Jesus stands up and he reads and he says, this day this passage fulfilled in your ears. I'm not sure why the chapter was left off here. Um, anyways, that's unfortunate that I can't find the reference right now. I should have looked that up ahead of time. However, Jesus reads the scroll of Isaiah and says, this day this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears. Isaiah 1.9 Uh, we'll look here. Isaiah 1 9 says, If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, a remnant there, we should have been like Sodom and become like to Gomorrah. Romans 9 29 says, it talks about Isaiah. As Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us an offspring, we'd have, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So even these things were being fulfilled in Christ in the New Testament era. And lastly, we'll read here Isaiah 52.11. We'll see this in the Corinthians passage here. <clears throat> Isaiah 52.11 says, Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Isaiah 43.6 I will say to the north, give up, and the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. And this is 2 Corinthians 5. And at the end of the chapter, or 2 Corinthians 6, 17, uh, this pulls in so many Old Testament passages. It's, it's really unique. This could be a paper of its own, how Paul is using these multiple Old Testament passages from Ezekiel and uh, elsewhere, uh, Leviticus, and talking about how he's going to be a God to us. We are the temple of living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them, walk among them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. You recognize that from Isaiah? Be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. I'll be a father to you. You shall be my son. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. You can see that very clearly. Uh, this is all, again... 
the Gospels and Paul seeing as beginning to be fulfilled at Christ's first coming and consummated at Christ's second coming, his final coming, these promises of the Old Testament being fulfilled. Alternatively, it is also possible to see the event of the partial fulfillment of Israel's returning from Babylon as a typological foreshadowing of the yet greater to come end time restoration in Christ. 8. Repeated major redemptive historical events. Candidates for types may also be those major redemptive historical events that in some fashion are repeated throughout the Old Testament and share such unique characteristics that they are clearly to be identified with one another long before the era of the New Testament. For example, Old Testament commentators have noticed the following. One, the emergence of the earth out of the water of Noah's flood has a number of affinities with the emergence of the first earth from the chaos waters described in Genesis 1. He talks about this above. Two, in several ways, the redemption of Israel from Egypt is patterned after the creation in Genesis 1. Three, Israel's return from Babylonian exile is pictured as a new creation, modeled on the first creation. Likewise, it is commonly recognized that second generation Israel's crossing of the Jordan is depicted like the first generation's crossing through the Red Sea, as likewise is Israel's restoration from Babylonian exile portrayed as another exodus, like the first out of Egypt. Israel's tabernacle the Sol uh, Solomonic Temple and Israel's Second Temple are all uniquely patterned in many ways after essential features in the Garden of Eden. In each of the three above examples of creation, exodus, and temple repetitions, the earlier events may not only correspond uniquely to the latter events, but within the Old Testament itself may also be designed to point forward to these latter events. Accordingly, these earlier Old Testament references that are linked together also typologically point to these same escalated realities in the New Testament reference to Christ and the church as the beginning of the new creation, the end time exodus, and the latter day temple. But uh, that's just amazing. If you think about it, the New Testament, those escalated realities that we have in Christ, the church is the beginning of the new creation. The church is the new end time exodus. The church is the latter day temple. And this, this is clearly taught in the New Testament. And they're not just making this up. They're seeing this same pattern carried out in the Old Testament. But even when key redemptive historical events are not being not repeated, a candidate for a type can still be discerned. It should, however, not be found among the minute details of a passage, but in the central theological message of the literary unit. And it should concern God's acts to redeem a people or in his acts to judge those who are faithless and disobedient. So we should not go to an Old Testament passage and try to pick out uh, you know, minute little details uh, and, and try to squeeze into them some kind of New Testament type. You know, for instance, the fact that, I don't know, um, something very specific that we could apply out of context. I can't even think of an example. But you basically shouldn't say, well, I only go shopping at Food Line because, Dave, uh, because Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily apply to what you as a New Testament Christian should use as your preferred grocery store. That would be kind of ridiculous. But in the central theological message of that literary unit, and as it concerns God's acts to redeem his people, and that's what we see in Scripture, and the purpose of Scripture is that we would understand God's purposes in redeeming a people for himself, and his acts to judge those who are faithless and disobedient, that is the general theme of Scripture. As it gives all glory to God, I think that you can obviously see that this type of typology and use of the Old Testament by the New is perfectly legitimate. Nine, other instances of typology. There are other interpretive ways to discern Old Testament types from the Old Testament itself. Thus, Christ is the anti-typical new Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Melchizedek, Adam, and Jonah. And you can see all these, I mean, clearly referenced in the New Testament. Just as Jonah was in the belly uh, for three days, three nights, so will Jesus be in the heart of the earth, etc. And, uh, you know, he's the Melchizedek priest there in the book of Hebrews. He is also the antitypical brazen serpent. You know, look at the serpent and live. Uh, I think that's uh, John 3.14. You know, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He is the antitypical manna, the temple, the sacrifice. And those already indicated must suffice for the purposes of the present discussion. We'll see how much we have left of this. I think we'll have to make a third video. We'll pick up there as we get to three, the presuppositions of New Testament writers in interpreting the Old Testament and their bearing on typology. But for now, we'll end this second video discussing Greg Bill's great article in Jets, published in 2020, 
on finding Christ in the Old Testament.